Hey folks, how we doing? All right. We will be in Hebrews uh, chapter 9 this morning, uh, picking it up, I believe in verse 23 is where we need to start today. Is that correct? Okay, good. We will read through, we're going to back up one verse to verse 22, and we'll read through verse 28, and uh, we'll finish out chapter 9. And then, uh, Lord willing, the voice holds up. We might get into chapter 10 as well. So, let me pray, and then we're going to jump right into this. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning. Again, we thank you for the time that we have to pray to you, to sing, and to worship, to study your word, to have preaching, Lord, to have teaching. It's just an amazing thing. We we thankful of the freedom that we have in this country, Lord, that... Truly, we can come together week in and week out without really any fear. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray for those all around this world that don't have that freedom. Lord, we pray for those Christians that are persecuted. We pray for them that are in house churches, in basements right now, Lord, fearing for their lives simply because they are a believer. So we thank you, Lord, that we know that you are with them. We know that you are with us here today. Help us again to, Lord, read the scripture, to understand it, to apply it to our lives. Lord, truly to know it to where we could teach it to another believer. So we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 9, uh, starting, uh, And according to the law... One may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment." So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. All right. As again, you know, the book of Hebrews, maybe not the first book, not the first letter that you want to jump into if you've only been saved a couple of weeks or months. This is not for new believers, Um, but it is definitely for Christians. We are to read this book. We are to study this book. And it is hard. We know this. We know we've covered so many chapters so far of the knowledge you have to have of the Old Testament just to understand the verses on the page before us. But we'll slow down and we'll walk through this. I will do my best, Lord willing, that we can understand this as they understood it in the first century so that we can understand it and apply it. Okay? So again, just real quickly in verse 22. According to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, Again, the writer of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, going back to the law, showing that the law itself showed that blood was needed for God to deal with sin. For God to forgive sin. We also know this as taught in the book of Hebrews, as taught in the Old Testament by the King David, by taught Jesus himself, that we know that the sacrifices, the, 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 the sacrificial Levitical temple system, though instituted by God, was never, okay, was never, it's never was purposed for actually dealing with sin. Temporary covering, okay, to get to the point of the Messiah himself shedding his blood, actually bringing atoning work to his people. That's what's going on here. So look at verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, 
but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. All right. You've got the Levitical system. You've got the temple system. You've got this uh, system of bringing in lambs and goats and pigeons and grain offerings and flour offerings and, and wine offerings and all of this um, work to be done inside uh, the temple. All of these things that needed to be, if you will, um, cleansed. Okay, this was done year by year. We, we talked about this uh, in past weeks. How in the Levitical system, the law of Moses, that there was this high priest. And once a year he would go into the Holy of Holies. Before he would, he would sacrifice uh, an offering for himself, be covered with the blood. He'd go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And he would sprinkle blood upon the Holy of Holies. Showing that Israel was guilty. Guilty of sin before the Lord. But because of his grace cleansed, covered by that blood. As that happened in the earthly realm, in the earthly temple, that was really just showing or foreshadowing what Jesus himself did in the heavenly temple, in the throne room of God. That he presented himself as the perfect sacrifice, as the Lamb of God, that his people are covered by his blood, and that they, you and I as believers, will be allowed into this heavenly realm. We will be allowed into this heavenly temple. Not reserved just for the high priest of Israel, but for any believer, Jew or Gentile, covered by the blood of Jesus, they will be able to approach the true Holy of Holies, and that is the God, God the Father on His throne in the heavenly realm. That's what's being taught here in verse 23. Real atonement, real forgiveness of sin does not come through the temple. You Hebrew Christians, you Hebrew false converts in the midst, stop relying on the temple system. You think that that makes you saved. It doesn't. It is by the blood of Jesus, the Messiah. Him in the heavenly realm, that sacrifice is actually what brings atonement or holiness. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, heavenly realm, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Here, here's an amazing truth. If you are in Christ, okay, this boldness, this holiness, this righteousness that Christ possessed and we had before the Father, He has gifted to us. When you and I leave this life, we physically die, we will be allowed, and if you really think about this, it should be overwhelming, you will be allowed to be in the presence of the one true God. In His majesty, in His holiness, in His sovereignty, in His wrath, you and I, because of the righteousness, the sacrifice of Christ, you will literally be able to stand in the presence of God. He did that for us. Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy. No, He did this and He appears in the presence of God for us. Nor was it, it says in verse 25, nor was it that He would offer Himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year in blood that is not his own. Again, the author here, who I argue is Paul, okay, he's, he's getting to think about this. He's getting the Jewish believers and these Jewish, if you will, maybe even false converts that continue to rely upon the law, that continue to rely upon the high priest and the sacrifices in the temple. Don't you get it? He himself, he died once. He died once, a perfect death. Okay, it's not ongoing. He did it one time. He is our high priest. Okay, and he does not need to do it year by year with the blood that's not his own. Okay, so again, this speaks directly against what we would call the theology of the Roman church or the theology of the Roman Catholic church. Okay. They're, they're literal. That whole religion is wrapped up in going to Mass so that the priests 
can offer up that wafer and that wine so that it becomes the actual blood and the actual body of Jesus sacrificed on that altar by that priest to give you a little bit more grace. That literally is the central theme of their teaching. Okay? This speaks directly against that. You and I are confident that Jesus' sacrifice 2,000 years ago, accepted by the Father, shown in His resurrection and His ascension, is perfect and accepted, and that is the righteousness, that is the sacrifice that we rely upon. It's not an ongoing thing. This was in direct contrast even to that first century where they'd say, okay, I'm going I'm to believe in the Messiah Jesus. Okay, that's great. I know that He's the Son of God. But obviously I keep sinning. I'm going to sin tomorrow and I'm going to sin next week and I'm going to sin the week after that. So I, I, I need more sacrifice. I, I got to go to the temple. This was just ingrained in their mind. Okay? So the author here is trying to get them to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is that perfect sacrifice. Okay, it continues in verse 26. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Okay, not just since the temple was constructed. All right, if this, if this sacrifice of Jesus once and for all wasn't good enough, technically, was there sin before God gave the law to Moses? Well, of course there was. We've got to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All right? So Christ didn't start sacrificing back then. It's because at the appointed time, okay, it says at the consummation of the ages, okay, at the appointed time, the Son of God comes into the world, lives that life, dies that death, and that is perfectly fulfilling God's plan, okay? He reiterates this. I, I know we sit here 2,000 years later and we're like, yeah, we get it. You don't have to keep saying it, okay? But this is what they struggled against. The author knows that Satan is using this crutch, this cult teaching of temple worship and temple sacrifices to distract from Jesus. Because think about it. If, if it is sacrifices in the temple or some weird sacrifice upon an altar by a current priest, if you're saying those things are needed, at the same time, what are you saying about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? Wasn't good enough. Wasn't good enough. We got to have more. Okay? And so, if you understand, every time you speak about adding something to the free grace this faith alone in Christ alone. Every time you speak against that, or a religion speaks against that, or a denomination speaks against that, you are actually demeaning what Christ accomplished on the cross. Does that make sense? Okay? All right? It is. It, whenever you speak against this, you are demeaning what Christ accomplished. Okay? Question. Sure. Yeah. And they'll actually say, oh, no, 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 we believe that he just died once and that it's not a real sacrifice. But if you go to the actual words of the catechism right. and, and what they do, it's that in the Latin text, it actually is an it is. sacrifice. Right. And in those words, they don't even do that. Right. So they, I would say that for, for 2,000 years, when you have these, these uh, false gospels, what they do is they keep their people in ignorance. The last thing you want people to do, if you're in that system or in another denomination that does a, a false gospel, if, if they had their people read this, what would happen? You'd revolt against this, right? You would revolt against the teachings, the so-called teachings of your church or the Roman church or whatever it is. Because, and again, this is why ignorance of Scripture is the number one tool used by Satan. That's what he does. Okay? People are kept in ignorance. Whenever the scriptures are available to people and it is taught and it is preached and it is read, 
The truth comes out. And it's overpowering. It's overwhelming. And you could read this. Again, this book is 2,000 years old, written to a bunch of Jewish believers in Jerusalem, different part of the world. But if you read this, take your time, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you can understand it, right? It's there. It may take two or three times to read it, but we'll get it, okay? So look at verse 27. Oh, I'm sorry, go back to 26. He would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once the consummation of the ages. Okay, this is, um, we need to understand this. God's always had plan A. It has always been plan A to create, to have his son go into the world, to have his son sacrificed for sinners. That was always plan A. From eternity past, pre-creation, that was always the plan. It's not plan B, all right? But that doesn't mean that God doesn't work in ages, okay? This is what is called um, progressive revelation. There are, ages are determined by what God has revealed to his people, all right? For instance, um, in the age of, let's say, Israel, the age of the law, the age of Moses, they didn't have this wonderful blessing of the New Testament. They had the Old Testament, and that was the age, and they lived according to what God had revealed to them. God doesn't stop there. He reveals himself more in, with the prophets. He reveals himself more with Jesus himself, the Son of God, and with the apostles and with the writings of the New Testament. So again, this is progressive revelation, and there are different ages upon which God reveals himself more and more detail. You and I are blessed to live in an age where we have the completed Word of God. Though we may forget, though we may take it for granted, though we get lazy and maybe don't read it as often as we should, we have the completed Word of God, and He wants us to know it. He wants us to read it. And this consummation of the age, at the perfect appointed time, He sends Jesus to die, to make that sacrifice, and to be raised. All right. And then there's a, this little closing here in 27 and 28. In verse 27, it says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after them comes, after this comes judgment. It's going to affect everyone. Okay? Again, they're thinking, first century Hebrews, they're so wrapped up in the nation of Israel and the temple worship and the priestly duties, and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They even think, and they're struggling with this, that the Messiah, Jesus, a Jew, obviously he died to save only Jews. Okay? They're still struggling with that concept. But it's been taught by Paul, by John, and this author here. No, 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 no. All men are going to die. All men are going to come under judgment. This Jesus, this Messiah, he's saving all kinds of people. Not just the Jews, but Gentiles as well. Okay? Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. Okay? For the unbeliever, physically die, their judgment is wrapped up in a couple of different things. If an unbeliever is to pass away right now, their soul immediately goes where? What we call hell. Okay? Or Gehenna. Hades. Okay? The unbeliever. All right? That already is starting the judgment. They are under, under the wrath of God. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, of darkness and of smoke and of fire. It's a horrible, horrible place, both physical and spiritual. Okay? But it doesn't stop there for the unbeliever. Okay? They are going to be raised. They are going to be resurrected bodies. But then they face another judgment. And we read about this in the, in the book of Revelation. It's the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 and 21. Okay? That unbeliever in this resurrected body, a physical body, spiritual body that will last for eternity. Unfortunately, that resurrected body is prepared for what place? Lake of fire. Okay? Where they will spend eternity forever in wrath in punishment, in darkness, okay? Because they are judged and they are in their sin, okay? That's for the unbeliever. For the believer, we know this, this side of the cross. The believer dies, you and I, 
Today is our last day. And our soul goes immediately where? Heaven. In the throne room of God in His presence. Because we are in Christ. We are in His righteousness. We are covered by His blood. Okay? And then ultimately, as we heard like earlier this morning, we will also enjoy this resurrection. A resurrection uh, body that is like Jesus. We will be forever in His presence uh, without sin and glorified bodies forever and ever. Okay? So, and as much as it is pointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment. Unbeliever and for the believer. Also, I want to hold on just a second. So the judgment for the believer. Judgment for sin has already taken place for the believer. When did it happen? On the cross itself. Okay? When he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is him taking the wrath that you and I are due. Okay? But we will face a judgment. It's actually a reward ceremony. And it's the judgment seat of Christ. The Bema seat of Christ. It is not a judgment for sin. There is no punishment, physical or spiritual punishment. It is the rewarding of what you have done in ministry under the power of the Holy Spirit before Christ. And He rewards you with crowns for what you have done in ministry. Now, there are going to be parts of this judgment where we are shown that there were works that we did, not necessarily with the right heart attitude. We didn't do it for the benefit and for the glory of Christ. Maybe we had selfish motives behind this. Okay? You're not judged as in a physical punishment for that, but there are, it looks like, crowns that are not given to us for that. Okay? So, unbelievers, judgment, hell, like a fire. Believers, okay, ultimately glorified, be the seat of Christ, crowns blessed to us. And even when we receive those crowns, guess what we end up doing? We throw them right back at Jesus anyway. Okay? I saw him, but Debbie. Punishment? Um, both are horrible. Both are described in similar fashion. Darkness, fire, smoke, weeping, gnashing. Um, one of the things that we need to understand, I don't mean to get too much detail because it's Sunday morning, but it is not only physical punishment, but it is also a spiritual and, if you will, uh, a punishment of the mind. They know the truth. They know that they are created beings. They know that God, Father, Son, and Spirit are the one true God. They know that they have no hope now. That there is no escape. They know all of that. And they live in eternity in punishment forever with that knowledge. Okay? So whether they're exactly the same hell and lake of fire, either way, it is absolute, utter hopelessness and punishment. Sure. Yeah. Now, again, um, it's important to study both hell and the lake of fire. Uh, the two things that Jesus preached about most. The first one is money. The second one is the reality, the, the real place, hell, the punishment for those that die in their sin. It's a real thing. Okay. A lot of times churches, we shy away from it, but you should know it. The truth of hell, the lake of fire actually should be motivating you to share the gospel of Christ with those around you. Because if you believe hell is real, and you know that the truth of the gospel of Jesus is real, and that person dies outside of Christ, where will they be? Yes. So share that truth. So what if they make fun of you? So what if maybe your friendship is you know, burdened? Who cares? In the light of eternity, does it matter? So we should share. Okay. So inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. All right. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. All right. So a little controversial, but you need to wrestle with this. Okay. 
So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins. Now what do you usually think that verse is going to say? Everybody. That's what we're taught, right? The modern American church for the last 80 years. But read it carefully. Read it really carefully. It will affect you. It will affect what you believe. It should affect what you teach. Christ also having been offered once. What does that mean, offered once? What is the author talking about? Offered once. Sacrificial offering, right? That's what he's already, that's the context. That's what he's been talking about leading to the verses up to this. Having been offered once to do what? Bear the sins of of many. Okay? This is what makes, for instance, John 17 make sense. He prays not for the world, he says. He prays for those whom the Father have given me. Okay? So, if this makes you uncomfortable, be uncomfortable. Wrestle with biblical truth. Always have what you believe. Always have what your theology is, what you teach others. Have it driven by the words on the page, not what you think they say. Okay? So Christ, also having been offered once to bear the sins of many. Now that many, this is the ekklesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. The called out ones. The ekklesia. E-K-K. L-E-S-S-I-A. Ecclesia. The called out ones. This ecclesia, brought from Greek into early Anglo-Saxon language, becomes Kirk. K-I-R-K. Kirk. Yep. Further anglicized into English, and it becomes... Church. We, the church, believers in Christ, we are the called out ones. Okay? The called out ones are the sins that Jesus bears. Does that make sense? Okay? Very clear. Very precise on what this author is saying. Question. Kirk, it's early Anglo-Saxon. It becomes church, the word church. Okay? Huh? Yeah, Old English. Okay? So Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many. He bears the punishment for the sins of many. For Jews, for Gentiles, for Greeks, for Romans, for barbarians. For those born in the past, for those born at the present time, for those born in the future. But notice, it does not say he bare the sins of all. Why? Because he only bore the sins of those whom the Father had given him. Now think about this. If you believe in the doctrine of hell, if you believe in the doctrine of the lake of fire, If you believe in the doctrine of once man is appointed to die once and then comes judgment, if you believe in that teaching and that doctrine, you've got to wrestle with this. If you believe that there are those that will forever be punished in the lake of fire, why are they there? Why are they there? Because the punishment for their sins, what? has not been born yet. No one has bared the punishment for their sins. Why? Because He bore the the sins for many. Okay? This is called particular redemption. Particular redemption. And the greatest teachers and the greatest preachers of particular redemption happens to be what denomination? Baptists. 
What? What are you talking about? I've been a Baptist my whole life. I've never even heard of this before. You've lived in a bubble where the gospel has been watered down. It's been changed a little bit to kind of remove itself from this kind of a, this is kind of offensive. You, you mean that Christ came to bear the sins of only those whom the Father gave him, the many? I thought he died and bore the sins of all. And then it's up to you to get God's attention. And when you finally understand everything, you tell God, hey, I want to be saved now. He goes, wow, that sounds great. He sends the Holy Spirit and then you cause yourself to be born again. That's the basic American gospel. Yeah? That is not the biblical gospel. The biblical gospel is this. God has appointed a time for his son to die. God has appointed a time that he will save all of those for whom the son did die for. All those who have been given to me will what? Will come to me. They will. This is particular redemption or particular atonement. For 400 years, this was preached and this was taught with passion, with energy by Baptists. And in the early 1900s, liberalism creeps in. What's called invitationalism is created, where we are inviting people to make a decision. And that decision directs God on what to do. Okay? That invitationalism was accepted and really went full force in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s. I don't mean to cast stones, but think back into American theology and American church life. What became popular in the 40s, 50s, and 60s? Billy Graham. Revivalism. Invitationalism. Really, it's called decision, decisionism. You decide, you accept, you make Jesus Lord and Savior. He reacts. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God is good and sovereign and holy. And if he has given you to his son, your eyes will be opened. Your ears will hear. The Holy Spirit at the appointed time will come upon you. And as Apostle Peter says, he will cause you to be born again. And the next thing you know, your eyes see Jesus. Your ears understand the gospel. You love Christ and you know you can't save yourself. And you want to be saved. And the next thing you know, I'm a believer. A miracle has occurred. God has invaded your life, drug you out of the darkness, opened your eyes, gave you a new heart, regenerated you, and as Peter says, caused you to be born again. Okay? Question. You said this, uh, Charles, I mean, I, I know that in Baptist, uh, nowadays, or in those days, if you believe in particular doctrine, um, particular doctrine, sure. that's the term. It is. Yep. Um, and yeah, it sounds a little, we're not used to that. We aren't. It's not something within American Christianity. But would you say, I and mean, this is really the liberalism of the um, which is man that you hear about that probably was the, I guess, the forefather of this one who brought it. Would you Charles Finney? Yep, Charles Finney back in the 1800s. But it was a problem even before that. A man you may know, John Adams. Ever heard of him? President John Adams? Okay. He came from a long line of what were called General Baptists. His, we had uncles and, and grandfathers and all this that were involved in the Congregational Church and also Baptist Church. But they were generalists. They said, no, 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 Jesus died for all. You need to make a free will decision. That free will decision directs God and then you will be saved. You direct it. Okay. The problem is, if you study church history, these generalists, General Baptist, generalist, Congregationalists, Actually, after one or two generations, they give birth to another group of people. Universalists or Unitarians. John Adams starts that movement in the early colonies. Okay, This Unitarian approach of 
sooner or later, okay, because Jesus did die for all, everybody ends up going to heaven. Okay? So, American history, that's just the way it is. But know this, don't miss the verse. So Christ also wrestled with this, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. That is us. That is the bride, those whom he has died for. We are the ones that look forward to the second coming of Jesus. We are the ones that eagerly await him. We believe in him for salvation. Not only that, we look forward to his second coming to his kingdom. Voice is going. <coughs> okay? Questions on 26, 27, 28. Yes. So, I'm still trying to wrestle with this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to articulate my question. Okay. So, what you said is that God... Yep. We don't have the power to like, accept that. <laughs> okay. So it's hard to, because you said it would be false comments. So the question is, would there be people that earnestly want to be saved, but that is all kind of election? All right, what does the Bible? Right Excellent now? question. What does the Bible teach? <clears throat> what does Romans 3 say? In their lostness, who seeks after God? No one. No one seeks for God. No one is righteous. No, not one. Okay? Again, this is what I believe is demonic influence. You and I grew up in what was interestingly called the seeker-sensitive movement. Ever heard of that before? Right? The seeker-sensitive movement in the 80s and the 90s, what we were basically raised in, Okay, it was, hey, there are lots of people seeking the truth and seeking God. Let's make our churches as friendly as possible. That way, as they're seeking, maybe our church will be the place that they find God and accept him. It was called seeker sensitive. The only problem with that whole movement is Romans chapter three that says, who seeks after God? Nobody does. Okay, and so unfortunately, they, they molded all of church to go after these people. So, again, it's not that there are those seeking, wanting to be saved. And then God says, no. Okay. According to the scriptures, before a, someone is saved by the Lord, what are they? They're lost. They're called sons of disobedience or daughters of disobedience. What family do you belong to? Satan. Satan. So not only has your sinful heart blinded you, your sinful nature has blinded you. Who else, who also else is busy blinding lost people? Satan himself. So you're veiled by Satan. You're veiled by your own sin. You're veiled by your own sinful nature. Not only that, you love it. Lost people love sin. They seek it. They magnify it. They encourage it. They love their own sin. Not only that, when others sin, they like it. That is, that is the biblical description of what you and I are before we are saved. Okay? So, does the person exist that wants to be saved and God says no? Doesn't exist. The only thing that does exist are a bunch of sinners that have given the opportunity. We will always deny God. We will always seek sin until what happens to us? Holy Spirit comes upon us and causes us to be born again. This is how bad sin is and our sin nature is. It's not that we can get fixed. It's not that the gospel is the medicine that we need and then he's going to fix us. Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be what? Born again. You have to have a complete miraculous starting over then you will have salvation in the Messiah does that make sense good question though I'll hand in the back so if the Holy Spirit is all powerful and irresistible correct how is it why is it that there are elected people that are elected in remote areas that we 
you have to physically reach and physically talk to and tell. Oh, excellent. Why doesn't God, uh, if God is in charge of salvation from beginning to end, why does he even, why does he incorporate us? I mean, my goodness, we're not even good at sharing the gospel. Half the time we're either too scared or too lazy and we don't want to do it. We are like the worst workers in the world. We are the worst possible solution to spread the gospel. Right? I mean, really? Goodness, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. How, how well have we done? How many billions of people right now have never even heard about Jesus? So have that in the forefront of your mind. Does he actually need us to do this? No. We read in Revelation, there is actually going to be a time where he sends an angel and everybody upon the planet is going to see this angel and he's going to share the full gospel of Jesus. Do they get saved when the angel does that? Nope. Don't. Literal angel in the sky explaining that Jesus is the only way to be saved and no one believes it. That's how bad sin is. Okay? So why? Why in the world would this all-powerful, sovereign, perfect, holy God, why in the world would he command us to share the gospel knowing that there are the elect and the non-elect and some are going to believe and some aren't going to believe? Why does he command us to do this? Because he chose to. That's the right answer, yes. In his creation, does he get to set the rules? Absolutely he does. But not only does he command us to, what we just studied, what do you and I get to experience if we are good and obedient and share the gospel with those around us? Irregardless if God saves them or not, but we are obedient in doing so. What happens? We're rewarded. That is how good and holy and loving he is. He doesn't need us to do this, but he has chosen to do this to bring us along as he is saving people because he wants to lavish his grace and his mercy and his gifts of love on us. Does that make sense? He doesn't need you and I to do this. But he's chosen to do it because he loves us and he actually wants to reward us for doing it. It's an amazing thing. Okay? Good question. Excellent question. To refine it, we get the impression that there are people right now in remote areas that need us physically to be there. Absolutely. Because we're not doing it for the sake of physical gain. Correct. And what happens? Okay, so hold on. So what is, are there people born, raised, die, and never have the gospel? Yes. There have been nations, kingdoms that have come to rise, live for centuries, been wiped out, and have never had the gospel. Now, the human fairness gene kicks in, right? And we start going, wait a second, wait a second. If they were never given the chance, that's not... Fair. It's not fair. God made a mistake. God doesn't know what he's doing. He knew that we would fail. Why would he leave it up to us to share the gospel with all these people? And then it doesn't happen. And then they die in their sin. That's not fair. And you know what? I don't like that. I don't like how God operates. Have Christians had those thoughts before? Say yes. So often, Paul had to address it. Paul had to write in the book of Romans, chapters 8 and chapters 9, explaining to them, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to question how God saves or judges people? Who do you think you are to sit in judgment over the one true God? You know what? You get busy being obedient. You leave that salvation stuff where it belongs. And that's with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Question. Last question for you, Lord, is saying, if you ever get the opportunity to spend time in the wilderness, would you actually do nothing else around and just graduate? It's difficult to deny God. Absolutely. 
There is that presence, if you will, that understanding. And that's what Romans 1 teaches. This is not an accident. This is not some cosmic explosion that produced all this. There's a creator. It is. Absolutely. That's literally Romans 1 says they are without excuse. Okay, question. Mm. Good point. Okay. So as you are wrestling, as some of you are wrestling with this, and some of you heard for the first time, some of you have heard it many times, but you're still not comfortable with it and you're wrestling with it. Know this. If you are a believer, okay, you're a part of the ecclesia, you're a part of those called out ones. You received grace, which is what's called unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to deserve it, right? Okay, that's why we call it grace. Not only that, as part of the ecclesia, the called out ones, you receive grace. You also received mercy. Mercy is a little different. Mercy is you've done something wrong. You deserve punishment, but the judge does not give it to you. You as the sinner, you as the Christian, have you received mercy? Absolutely. Grace, unmerited favor. Mercy. All right. Now, to make it just, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. That sin deserved punishment. When did that happen? On the cross. Well, yeah, but he, I mean, goodness, Jesus couldn't take all of the punishment for my sin. He did. The eternity in hell, the lake of fire that you deserve that billions of Christians deserve, he bore all at once. Eternal punishment. This is why we know he is the God-man. He is all divine. He is all man. Because only that Messiah could take the punishment. Okay? So your punishment has been dealt with. You've received grace and mercy and justice. Justice has been doled out unto his son. Those who die in their sin... Have they received injustice? Think about it. Those who die in their sin, do they have a sinful nature? Do they sin willingly? Even embracing sin. The Bible's declared that they're sons of Satan, sons of disobedience. Okay? They are punished. And eventually they will be in the lake of fire forever. Receiving justice and punishment for their sin. Those two groups of people, believers and unbelievers, those rewarded with heaven and grace and mercy, being in Christ, and those receiving punishment, did either one of those groups receive injustice? No. Is God allowed to express His attributes as he so chooses. Whose permission is he going to ask? No one. This is the part as believers we struggle with. We don't want anyone to, to go to hell and do this. Okay? So be motivated by this. Hell is real. Lake of fire is real. It is forever. These are real things. These are real people. Real souls that could go there. Share the truth of Jesus with them. With anybody that will listen. Okay? If you have questions on this, email me, text me, come and talk to me. Make sure what you believe, your theology, what you teach, what you teach your children and neighbors and, and other believers, make sure it is driven by what the words actually say, not what you think they say. All right? Questions? We're going to stop here. My voice is almost gone. <laughs> All right, Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, your word is clear, it is precise, and it is without error. We thank you, Lord, that although we read verses and passages that, that we struggle with, Lord, that make us uncomfortable, we rest in this, that you are God. You are perfect and holy and loving, and you are also wrathful against sin. So Lord, motivate us. Put it upon our lips, our minds, our hearts, Lord, to share the truth of salvation in Jesus, Lord. Drive us to do this. 
Drive us to read your word, to memorize your word, to be saturated by it. Lord, I thank you that you have given us this church, that we are gathered together week in and week out, Lord, and we have the freedom to do this. Lord, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. I will see you next week. Oh, we are not. Thank you. <laughs> I will see you uh, at Plaza Campus for Gathering Sunday next week.